I'm an Elden Ring fanatic, but I'm also an anthropologist, and in this video, we're going to take a deep dive with an anthropological perspective of the meaning of the Blessing of Despair ending in Elden Ring. Now this is perhaps one of the hardest endings to wrap your head around, and I too beat my head on the wall for a while trying to get at its deeper meaning. Now, as we know, there are several possible endings in Elden Ring for the player to choose from, depending on their actions in the game. In my last video, we took a deep dive into the Age of Order ending. This is the one many players believe represents the best of the endings. And while the endings fix and reset the world in some way or another, most endings exclude one group of the inhabitants of the lands between who we are told are eternally cursed. And that group are the creatures known as the Omen. In the game, Omen are a breed of cursed beasts born without grace. Although an omen can foretell good tidings, omens, generally speaking, are bad. For example, The Omen was a 1976 movie foretelling of the arrival of the Antichrist. In the game, omens are fearsome beasts. They are hulking and brutish, and they're covered with all these twisted horns that grow out of their body. Here's a close-up of one I just killed a few minutes ago. They have mysterious origins going back to the Crucible Age. They, they're cursed with some form of impurity. They're a failed experiment like our Neanderthals. They're often associated with a formless mother. We fight a few bosses that are open, like Morgat the Omen. Alter, we see an arm growing out of an egg, resting on a humic pelvic skeleton. Just like we will soon find secret curses on Dung Eater's victims in the game. And we see the accursed blood dripping from a hand. Now the idea that blood can transmit curses or some sort of social impurity is very old and found in many religious and social cultures throughout the world. Perhaps the most known is the curse of Cain and the mark that God placed on him after he killed his brother Abel. Some myths held that the sign of Cain was a horn, like the omen have horns in Elden Ring. There are even creatures in the game who specialize in killing omen and a fearsome mask that you can wear while doing so. So what we know about the omen are the following. They have some sort of blood curse they're outcasts, they represent some primordial impurity, they are the lowest social standing creatures in the land between, they're hunted down by omen killers, and their souls cannot return to the earth tree. Eternally cursed, hunted down as freaks of nature, no one speaks for the omen, until one day a tarnished emerged named Dung Eater, and he had a vision, and the omen became central to his vision of what the new order should be. In many ways, Dung Eater is much like the noble Gold Mask. Both were tarnished, and both developed their own vision of a possible new order in the lands between. Now, some may prefer Gold Mask over Dung Eater's vision, but they both aim at some greater good. But the Dung Eater is all in for the Omen. He's serious. Dung Eater has completely embraced the Omen cause, even going so far as to encase his entire body in their skin. And he's prepared to usher in a new era on behalf of the oppressed minority of the Omen. He will spread their loathsome curse to everything and defile the Gordon Order itself. 
But right away, you run into a problem. How can despair be a blessing? Despair is a negative emotion, a negative thought. It can hardly be described as a blessing. In fact, some consider it this ending among the worst outcomes possible for the lands between. Yet, Dung Eater thinks otherwise. He thinks his ending is the best ending of all. Wrong fools. My fate was the grandest. Most brilliant of them all. Is this true? Or is the Dung Eater a total psychopathic monster who should be stopped? Now the player's mission in the game is to fix the broken world of the lands between and establish some new cosmic order. This will finally bring an end to the rot, the poison, and the suffering that comes with existence. Now suffering is a major theme in both religion and philosophy. There's even a name for it. It's called Theosity. Theosity, in philosophy and religion, seeks to reconcile the existence of evil with an all-powerful and good God. Religious scholars have debated this for eons. In philosophy, it was made more popular by Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher, and from his book, The World as Will and Representation. In it, he painted a rather pessimistic and grim world overseen by a force called the Will, which, much like the Greater Will in Elder Ring, is responsible for all the suffering in the world. His ideas were pushed further by his most famous disciple, Frederick Nietzsche, the mad philosopher who proclaimed God to be dead and urged superhumans to embrace the Will to Power. Nietzsche is commonly referred to as the father of nihilism, which is a belief that holds that nothing has any value, there's no meaning to anything, and there's no point to anything. A true nihilist would believe in nothing, have no loyalties, and no purpose other than burn everything to the ground. But the Dung Eater is not a nihilist. He believes in something. He has a purpose and he aims to build something new. Now, alongside nihilism, another school of thought arose on solving the problem of human suffering. Now, that's called antinatalism. Antinatalists believe that coming into existence is always a terrible idea, and that the world is always going to be better off without more people. The idea being that we can end all suffering by simply stop bringing new people into the world. This idea was popularized by David Benatar in his book, Better Never To Have Been. But the Dung Eater is not an antinatalist either. In fact, his plan requires more births, more new people in order to succeed. Now, in order to complete the blessing of despair ending, we will need to interact with two NPCs both of whom are pretty nasty fellers. Although they come across as villains and vile individuals, they are both classic anti-heroes. The first, Blackguard Big Bogart, is a tarnished like ourselves, and when he's not out committing crimes, he sells us helpful You're consumables. Too, ain't you? Can you see it then? The guidance of grace, I mean. I can't see it at all no more. Makes no bloody sense anyway. Why some no-name shithead like me should get called to the lands between? Cruel bloody joke, you ask me. Maybe something went tits over it. Maybe it's been broke for a good long time. My mistress we later meet on one of his victims. I was accosted by a ruffian. And now I'm in a bind. Could I ask you lend a hand? Perhaps. That thug made off with a precious necklace. I need someone to retrieve it. Only... He, too, is tarnished. So we know that he's a tarnished. He can no longer see the guidance of grace. He's been referred to as a ruffian, a thug, and a petty thief. 
He also tells us he's an ex-convict when talking to us about the lonesome dungeon. Something I should probably tell you. You heard of the Dunk Eater? He's a madman. Has it out for everyone. Curses him. Goes round in his rank and armor and all. You see him though. Stay well away. I was in the same jail as him once, so I know first hand. He's a god forsaken monster. Not just some petty dog like me. He's a killer. Kills people. And curses the souls. Does all sorts of shit to the corpses. To keep them cursed forever. So we now know that the Dung Eater is also a tarnished. He also no longer sees the guidance of grace. He identifies himself strongly with the Omen and their cause. He's even fashioned an armor set with omen horns. He's also a, a serial killer. He defiles corpses and he embeds curses on their souls. Both are lost souls, outcasts, and damaged goods. Dung Eater's quest requires us to harvest seedbed curses from various victims that he's butchered throughout the world. We learn more about these seedbed curses. So the seedbed curse is what grows from the corpses that have been defiled by the dung eater. And by consuming these seedbed curses, the dung eater prevents the souls of the deceased from returning to the earth tree, kind of leaves them in a limbo. It's one of the most loathsome things found in the lands between. And the Dung Eater makes it very clear that he'd have no problem defiling you if he could. As we know that defilement is the spoiling of something, making it dirty, filthy even. The Dung Eater literally eats excrement. Now the Japanese term for defilement is associated with pollution that can come from contact with death or the dead. When we first encounter Dung Eater, he rattles on about a curse of pox and the reviled blessed, but otherwise he pays us little mind. Have you ever felt the curse? With your whole being, the pox upon life itself, feared and despised by all, the reviled blessing? <sighs> Apparently not. You are but a lamb, a stranger to defilement, ignorant of your own ignorance. You no longer interest me. I've been long without peace. Don't spoil my quietude. I asked you not to disturb me. Be thankful of the whole serenity. It is all that keeps your death and defilement at bay. After we find our first seedbed curse in the capital city, when we come back to Dung Eater, he says he can actually smell the curse on us. No. Wait. You have felt the curse. I can smell it on you. The box, yet tender. Apparently my seedbed is ripe and waiting. It was a brief respite, I must say. Go and unshackle my corporeal flesh, trapped in the sewer jail below the capital. I can kill you and defile your corpse. Then the pox will truly be your own. We unlock his cell, and he tells us of his diabolical plan to infect the world with the curse. I will kill again and defile each corpse with care. Just to be sure that when they're reborn, they'll be cursed, along with their children and their children's children for all time to come. Now, by letting him out of his cell, he eventually butchers Bogart and leaves a seedbed curse at his body which we can collect and give to the dummy. <laughs> Serves me right. 
in bloody hand. For a jump to blow shit with big ideas. Help me out. Would you mate? I don't want to get cursed. <laughs> Just let me die. I don't want to live like this. Not anymore. So, please. Give me your blessing. Defile my flesh with the seed bed curse. Again and again. Until it is done. Until a cursed ring coalesces, and may one day defile order itself. Countless I have killed, and countless I have defiled, and soon the fruits will be born. Hundreds will be reborn cursed, and they'll bear thousands of cursed children, who bear tens of thousands more. A few of those will be born just like me, and they'll kill and defile, and bless in my stead. My corporeal flesh lies in the sewer jail beneath the capital. Give it your blessing. Defile my flesh with the seedbed curse, until a curse ring coalesces that may one day defile order itself. Now that we know his sinister plan, it's up to the player to find a total of five seedbed curses to bring back to the leader. Sounds like birth pangs as he brings forth a special rule. His solution to restoring order to the lands between. All that is left for us to do now is simply to defeat the Elden Beast. Claim the title as the new Elder Lord, and usher in Dung Eater's vision, the blessing of despair.
the reviled curse that defined our age. The blessing of despair. Well, that sure doesn't sound like a happy ending, does it? But what exactly has happened? We are left without any clear idea of what this new order means or what it looks like. What has it actually accomplished? As we learned, the Omen are an oppressed minority. They are at the bottom of the social class. They are cursed forever, so they are essentially hopeless souls. So how can we fix this unfair balance of power? One way is to somehow make the Omen the majority. Even better would be to make everyone an Omen, sharing the same Omen blood, the same Omen curse, the same defiled. The curse becomes a blessing only when everyone is cursed, as the description of the room makes it clear. If order is defiled entirely, defilement is defilement no more, and for every curse, a cursed blessing. Yeah, it sounds kind of weird for sure, but what this ending actually achieves is the ultimate blood equality, a world where everyone is like everyone else, blessed in their cursedness. It all sounds a bit perverse, but the game permits it as one of the endings and apparently the greater will has no objection to it. Now, could we envision how this ending would work in the real world? I think we can approximate it with an example from the Hindu caste system. Now, the Hindu caste system is ancient and divides individuals into strict hierarchy. At the very bottom of the system are the Dalits. They are cursed from birth to forever occupy the lower depths of Hindu society. They've historically been referred to as untouchables, implying that even touching them could potentially spread their impurity. Like the Omen, they are relegated to the dirty work. One could say that the Dalits have inherited a blood curse. Now on the other side of the spectrum, there are the Brahmins who sit at the top and below them, others still. The Brahmins occupy the highest rungs of society as priests, academics, professionals. They are blessed by birth with this privileged position in Hindu society. One could say that the Brahmins have inherited a blood blessing. Under this system, the Brahmins dominate the Dalits and others beneath them. Now, could there ever be a time when the Dalits rise above the status of Brahmins? But how could this be achieved if Dalits are Dalits forever, and Brahmins are Brahmins forever? Well, one way would be to somehow pass the Dalit blood onto everyone through birth, essentially making everyone untouchable. And to do this, they would need something akin to the room of mending of the fall human. The caste system would collapse if everyone were untouchable. They would lose all class distinctions. An ultimate blood equality would reign supreme. And therein, by a twist of logic, lies the blessing of despair. This ending makes the Dung Eater something of a social justice warrior. He's trying to bring about an equitable society in the most unconventional and disturbing way. But perhaps Dungeter's plan was, in fact, the most They're brutal. Wrong fools. My fate was the grandest, most brilliant of them all. Who knows? In fact, we'll never know. The developers have given the player a limited number of options to decide the fate of the lands between. The Blessing of Despair was included as one of them for a reason. And I think it's to explore a radical thought experiment in social engineering in a fantasy world with an eye on examining our own forms of social engineering. 
Most of us are convinced that our world is broken, fallen, cursed. Even. It's a powerful idea that's been around for a very long time. And likewise, the idea that human beings can fix the world, set it right, is just as powerful a delusion. The human animal is a social animal, and we tend to organize ourselves along hierarchies. And hierarchies are inherently unequal. Even in the most stable societies on earth, and even in heaven, there are hierarchies of angels. I've since developed a certain respect for the dung eater and his vision, and as a spirit ash puppet, he's also a great companion against bosses. But who's to say that even in a world where everyone and everything is cursed and defiled, where equality reigns supreme, I'm sure something will eventually arise that will lead to a new kind of separation and a different kind of hierarchy that will soon fill the void. That's just what people do. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments below. May the golden order shine through you.